The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Views from the sidelines. Malik Hill across from me. I'm Joey Tysick, and uh, NBA Finals are over. And um, so, NBA Finals are over. Basketball season is over. Um, but we're gonna do one last basketball list today as a fun little topic because we got the NBA draft coming up very quickly. Uh, kind of just jumped in on us. Um, and there's also a little bit of uh, basketball news from the Pistons, our favorite team. Unfortunately, no right comment. now. <laughs> um, and the yeah. Lions made an interesting move. So we'll talk about both of those. And then we'll recap the NBA Finals. And then we'll get into our fun little list. Um, so right off the top, Monty Williams officially fired. Tom Gore said, five years, $65 million left on his deal. That's fine. We can, I'll absorb it. Love it. Love to hear that. This is a very small positive because it was obvious. Like Trajan Langdon, Trajan Langdon is making like bare minimum moves that any average GM would make, in my opinion. Right. So he's doing what has to be done. I'm honestly shocked that Tom Gore's cut bait this fast. Just be, he seems like a prideful guy that like yeah really loves his decisions, and yeah, him cutting Monty this loose. It must show that he wants to put trust into Trajan Langdon, which I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I mean, the Fred Vincent hire, I personally like a lot. He helped Lonzo Ball get his three-point percentage all the way up to, like, almost 40%, and he helped a few other guys improve his shooters too. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's decent so far. Yeah. Decent to good start for Trajan Langdon. Yeah. And Tom Gore's not being an idiot. I think the, the most interesting part will be where do they go with their next head coaching selection? That I'm not too sure about. After Lee, after going for Monty, I don't think you can go with the like experienced quote unquote like playoff level coach yeah. right now. Like the he's only, a he's a guy he needs a few all stars and a team full of veterans yeah. in order to succeed in this league, which mm-hmm. Sounds like it's not saying much, but Monty Williams was a very high level coach. Yeah. Before this last stretch, I think he just didn't fit the Pistons. Yeah. And I, a lot of Pistons fans got super excited. I got excited because he's been such a successful coach. Right. He didn't m- mesh with what was going on, and it was clear from the jump mm-hmm. once game started. So, yeah. Uh, somebody young and energetic. I don't. I haven't looked at a list of coaches yet. But yeah, the ones, they need to go to the opposite of Monty Williams. The only one that I know of that I've seen is James Borrego. I don't know. Like I don't know how I feel about it. He was put in a tough situation in Charlotte. Yeah. So it's hard to get a full judge. Um, they had some decent teams. Um, and then I quickly looked at a list. Uh, we have like Sean Sweeney. He's a lead assistant and head of defense for the Mavericks, uh, Johnny Bryant, associate head coach of the Knicks, um, Micah Nori, uh, lead assistant for Minnesota, um, Jerome Allen. He was an assistant under Dwayne Casey in Detroit at some point. Um, Chris Quinn, he was in the running. I like Chris Quinn a lot. He was in He's the running. He's been with Miami for years. Yeah, and, and before they hired Monty, he was in the running beforehand. Yeah. And then Will Weaver, he's an assistant with Brooklyn. I think the funniest one, though, would be out of left field, they hired J.J. Redick under the Lakers' noses. That would, listen, just out <laughs> of just funny factor. Yeah. That would be hilarious to me. It's not happening. No, that's a, It's not going to happen. But I, at this point, I, I, I wouldn't be angry if it happened. Yeah. Just because it's something new and fresh mm-hmm. and – I, I don't know. The only thing I still have questions about is who's making our draft picks. Is Trajan I, just going to pick 
take the bad maybe, draft picks? Maybe. That's, hey, maybe that's what's going to happen. That may, that's the part that makes me nervous. There's so much up in the air, even with these few moves being made so far. Like, we need a GM and a head coach. Now. Yeah. I mean, necessarily you don't need a head coach right now, but it'd be nice to have them both before the draft so we can be like, okay, he fits into my, my coaching style a little bit. Like, there might be a little bit of sway there. So, I don't know. It They got a, a week to do it, did we say? Next week is the actual draft. Jeez. You might as well wait till after the draft because draft yeah. like hiring a GM this weekend, right? And him like getting prepared for a draft in like five days, yeah. Well, that doesn't make sense either. Yeah, at, at least, well, uh, I say at least get a GM, just so we have some sort of direction, and be like, I'm taking this guy, we're going there. But I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting. But either way, it's a start. It's a fresh new take. Um, I'm sure it's not the last move that's going to happen. For the Pistons, whether it be the front office or players, things are going to get kind of wild, I think. So, fun to watch. The Lions made a big move um, and signed Jake Bates, the... Uh, Breakout kicker. Yeah. From the UFL. Um, he's been fairly good. I think he was 17 of 22, if I'm not mistaken, on the season. Uh, so, it's not a crazy good percentage, but... His his percentage like past fifty is what's been the most shocking thing. Yes, but and, and over sixty and the like seventeen out of twenty two. He's only missed one kick that was like under fifty. I think yeah. it was like a thirty nine yarder. All those other what four kicks were past like fifty yards because his coach believed in him to kick long. He had multiple sixty yarders. Yes, and a couple of fifties. His, his first ever kick he made was a sixty four yard game winner. Yes, which there are NFL kickers that have never done that. Yes. Um, the Lions were also working out, is it Jake Turner? James Turner. James Turner. Yeah, kicker from Michigan. Jake Bates, James Turner, yeah. Um, kicker from Michigan. A lot of people were kind of excited about him. I don't know how you felt about him. I I liked him too. I can't remember how he did in college. I'm I'm so ingrained of. He was, he was decent throughout the season, mm -hmm. and then he was perfect against Ohio State. Yeah. And honestly, in, in big moments, he didn't miss. Yeah. And that's what was big for Michigan fans. So now the Lions have Jake Bates and Michael Badgley on their roster as kickers fighting for the job. A lot of people are a little bit upset, though, that James Turner get, didn't get a chance. Um, they wanted it to be James Turner versus Jake Bates. That's honestly what I thought it would be. Um, people just don't like Michael Badgley. I think I'm, Michael Badgley is good enough. Yeah. I, they just don't kick often. <laughs> right. Part of it is because of the head coach, and part of it is because Michael Badgley is average. Yeah. I think it's more just because of the approach. Right. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Like, I I think I would have rather the young guys. I mean, Michael Badgley is still fairly young. But um, I think I would have just went with the new guys. But, I, again, the big thing is, like, the Lions, they don't kick a ton. And it's hard to say, would they have kicked more if they had confidence? I'm not sure. Um, So it'll be interesting to see. Who ends up getting that job? I'm sure a lot of people want Jake Bates to get the job um, just for his big leg and being able to possibly punch in some some 50-plus yarders that we know the Lions did not go for last year. So that will be an interesting little thing in training camp and such. But little Lions news. Um, and then finally, the NBA Finals are over. Was this the, like... To me, this was like one of the most disappointing finals Listen, in a there, while. There has been a lot of bad feeling and controversial like thoughts about these playoffs overall and the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just felt like it it didn't feel like the finals. Like it felt like a playoff series, but there there was no like heavy feeling, there was no major weight to it. There were no big performances. The finals MVP averaged like 25 and 5, Jalen Brown. Mm -hmm. The best players didn't play amazing. It was just a strange finals. Yeah. Now, well, I, the weird thing, too, real quick uh, about the stats Jason Tatum quietly was the sixth, sixth player in NBA finals history to lead his team in points, rebounds, and assists. And he didn't win the MVP. Like, yeah. that tells you it's just. It was just yeah. weird. Everybody unanimous, unanimously agreed Jalen Brown yeah, was like I, the best player in the series. I thought after like game two, I said if the Celtics win the series, he's the yeah. MVP. So, I don't know. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but if you had anything. It's a, uh, 
Boston just had one of the most dominant seasons in NBA history. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's unfair. I've seen a lot of people say it's a Mickey Mouse ring. It's like it's the, it's one of the easiest Easts in NBA history. They play who's in front of. I I don't yeah. judge people by that stuff, man. Mm-hmm. You play who's in front of you, and I do not judge what happens. Right. But <laughs> it still does feel like it doesn't feel whole or, or complete for some reason. Yeah. And I don't know. If May completely why I don't know if it's just because Joel and B could never finish a playoff series. Yeah, like the Knicks weren't fully healthy. Maybe they could have been a better matchup in the Eastern Conference Finals. Or if the Nuggets or Timberwolves would have made that too, made it back. I, I just, feel like the D- Denver was the best team in the West, and they yeah. lost. In and the I second feel like round. the Timberwolves would have matched up better. Probably. Like my biggest fear with this this whole Finals matchup was how was Dallas going to react because their bigs are all still young. They don't play a ton of defense. The the game that they play defense, they won. And they only rely on two scores for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tim Hardaway has I, disappeared. I forgot he was he even on the team. He should be arrested <laughs> for stealing money. Jeez. <laughs> uh, this, it, it is an understatement. I don't understand what, his, what happened to his career, basically. What happened to Maxi Kleba's jumper, too? Yeah. He, just, he looks like a, like a business executive in an NBA uniform out there. Yeah. Every time he shoots, it looks like he should not be on the court. Right. He should be doing something else. It's just weird, too. Like, they start Derrick Jones a lot. So, it's Derrick Jones, Derrick Lively, and uh, Daniel Gafford. And there's not a lot of def- or not a lot of offense there. So, then you're, like, really relying on Luka and Kyrie. Okay, yeah. And then, <sighs> Luka... That's a whole. That's Amen. like a whole another discussion. Yeah. We we will talk about that at another time, <laughs> because how he acts, I it goes against everything I love about basketball and high level yeah. basketball players. He's I, yeah, he's becoming worse than James Harden, and I don't think it's too wild to say. Just just because <sighs> I, I I don't want to talk about it right now. I I don't want to go deep into it. Yeah. But it's but Luca was a problem. Yes, and he's part of the reason why they why they couldn't win. I believe it was game three. Yeah, when he fouled out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when he see, he mentally took himself out of the game. And see, that's why I was I, that's why I never had faith in the in the Mavericks team. Again, I I gave them their props for making it to the finals, but like I was so surprised for them to even make a run. I, I just there's something about Luca's game that I just I feel like is going to be so hard for him to pull through and win. And I don't know exactly what and he the, needs. The crazy part is this is the most he's adjusted in his career this year. Yeah. Was the best he's done adjusting to like players around him mm-hmm. and still being great. Right. So I'm not sure where he goes from here. Again, it will be kind of a long discussion, maybe at the beginning of next season, but man, it was just, again, they still need roster upgrades. Yeah. They made the finals somehow, and they still need to upgrade the roster. Yeah, and the Celtics cruised to victory. And then again, the worst part about it was when the Mavs were finally competitive, they blew the Celtics out by 40. And so there was no, like, competitive games yeah. for the most part. Uh, the funny thing was, I believe, just because of that, like, 40-point win, going into game five, the, like, point spread or something of, like, the total series – the Mavs were like ahead of the Celtics just because of that one game. Um, but it doesn't tell you that the series was close. Like it, the Celtics were in full control and the games just weren't, there wasn't really any drama. To they the got games. one great game out of Porzingis in game one. Yeah. And they really didn't need him besides that. That's how weird this series was. Yeah. Yep. They, Derek White didn't really have to do anything offensively. They just needed to play defense. Drew Holiday didn't have to do anything. And hit open shots. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Congrats to the Celtics. You win your 18th championship in franchise history. Big whoop. Whatever. (laughs) I hate them. Um, But, yeah. Just a disappointing end to the season, in my opinion, for the NBA. Because, again, we saw, like, the Timberwolves make a run. We saw them be a young, fun team to watch. And then... Yeah, the East fell flat. I I don't know if there was much in the East. Indiana surprised people, but even when they 
made it, you're like, eh, they're not going to win another yeah. series. Once the Knicks got hurt, you're just like, man, that was the fun side of the East. So, I don't know. I'm not sure. Not sure to where to go. So, unfortunate. But anything else yeah. about the finals that you have? Just, just a weird end to the season. Yeah. And a lot of people are afraid, <laughs> like with LeBron going out and stuff, that there's – I have faith in the next crop, crop of stars. Like that's not the problem to me. Yeah, I I just I I don't I'm not sure what they need to fix, but something has to be. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just don't know. Like how long can the Eastern Conference be so <laughs> low to the Western Conference? I don't know how this started in league yeah. history, but it's like starting to get a little alarming. It's weird though too because, like the past few years, we thought, oh, the East is finally. Gonna be they, the they had a few good years, and then all of a sudden, like the West is flip flopped. Like Minnesota is a two seed. Oklahoma City is a one seed. The super did, young Thunder. Yeah. How is the West just doing that? Like that keeps happening. Where like they get these young teams. Like it's almost like back when, uh, in like two thousand five, two thousand four was when it first happened, when the Suns became relevant, and then they had that yeah. big run. I mean, they never did anything, but it was like. They elevated their team, and I don't know. The West just always somehow reloads. And even when we think the East is going to be good, they somehow fail. And I I don't know. That's why I said, I don't know how you fix that. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe when you add in the um, the expansion teams in a few years. I think that is going to be so much fun. Maybe that's when you, like, slide Minnesota and Memphis over, maybe. Yeah. And then you have, like, Vegas and Seattle and – Maybe that's how you balance it out more, but yeah, I, I don't know how you fix it. I would love if they bring both those teams in at the same time. I think they're going to have to just, you know, to make the the league even. Yeah. It's it's tougher to bring in one team. I mean, they've done it before, um, but like that expansion draft will be a lot of fun because we haven't had one since Charlotte, um, and we all know how bad the Bobcats were. Yeah, but I think with two teams entering. You have to protect, I think you usually protect less players or something like that. Um, and teams, some teams are getting deeper where you can have some some decent rosters for those expansion teams. I'm just, I'll just be curious. It makes the league more fun, in my opinion, um, because it, it can also potentially even the league out. I don't know if it's going to happen. It might make it more top-heavy. But I think at least like Vegas would be an enticing place to go play, obviously. Um, and if it's Seattle, there might be some some guys that want to go play out there because it's got a history, I guess. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Do you think they'd ever consider stripping the East versus West and just go top sixteen teams in the playoffs? They that comes up all the time, and I just don't, I don't know. I don't think there's any other way to like fix this Eastern like problem. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know what else you can do. Yeah, hmm. it, it's a good point, and I. I don't know if I would mind if they if they gave it a shot one year, or what they do, what they should do, in my opinion. And may, problem is, it might not convert. But my thought is, if they're going to keep doing the in season tournament, make that the top sixteen, just straight up and down, and give it a little test run to see how it feels again. It's not going to convert fully to the playoffs because you know, that's a Mickey mouse championship. Um, but it might give you an idea at least to see how it goes and then maybe implement it the next year into the actual playoffs, see how it goes and then go from there. But yeah, I agree. They have to figure, they've got to figure something out. Listen, there were, I remember in, I believe it was 2014, the Phoenix Suns won 50 games and didn't make the playoffs. Yeah. There have been multiple years mm-hmm. in the Western Conference where 50 games was like the initiation. Yeah. If you have to win 50 at least to get in here. Mm-hmm. And in the East, it was like 41, come on in. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, if you remember remember back to some of the Western Conference all-star teams, you had uh, KG, Dirk Nowitzki, Tim Duncan, Kobe Bryant, and like Steve Nash or somebody like that, yeah. all on the same team. And it used to be wild. Um Shaq, Yao Ming, they had, like, gigantic players. Um, and the East was more of the gritty kind of athletic guys. I don't know. It's always interesting to see. But, yeah, I, I agree. I think they got to change something. So, 
unfortunate NBA season is over. Kind of thank goodness. Now we get to, once we get through the draft, we get through our Pistons intervention. Football season is back in swing. Yeah. Um, and your wheelhouse coming up with college football. So listen, we got to start talking about. We're a few months away. We, we have to talk about realignment. <laughs> We got to talk about realignment. <laughs> yes. Which, uh, Conference previews will be very different this which year. Which there has been some wild stuff even since we've even talked about any college yeah. football stuff. So teams are all over the yeah. place. Shouts out to the Pac-2. <laughs> Oregon State and Washington oh, State. Shit. Still thugging it, thugging it in the West Coast. Oh, man. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, we'll get to that. Is SMU in the ACC or something? Yes. Yeah. SMU That's... and Cal. Oh, boy. The Atlantic, Atlantic Coast Conference. Anyways. You got to love it. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> That's that's a mess. Yeah. We'll get to it. All right. Our fun topic of the day. Kind of figured um, we'll go with somewhat of a draft integration here. With We're going to go with our top five favorite slash best. Mine's kind of a mixture yeah. of guys that were really good in college and also had really good NBA careers. Our criteria here will be vastly different. The one... Similarity is that we're not going to pick any one and duns. Yeah, nope. this, this entire era, the past 10, 15 years, is one and duns. Yeah. Over and it's it's what the mm-hmm. it became for a long time. Right. So for me, you know, normally I like Carmelo would be like my number one guy. Yeah. One championship in college, one and done. He's and gone. He appreciates the accomplishment for what he did. Right. But we're talking about real accomplished college basketball players. Yeah. Two to four years at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, with that in mind, we have a couple of honorable mentions, um, and then we'll get into our top five. Uh, do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? I'll start. So, okay. I got to include this guy in my honorables just because of how much I used to trash him. <laughs> like throughout the season, going into the tournament, I, I said this guy I didn't like him at all. I thought he was going to do nothing for his team in the tournament. And they ended up, like, making the Elite Eight. And he's been <laughs> a decent to good backup point guard. Now on a championship team, and that's Peyton Pritchard. He was an All-American level point guard in college. Oregon's best player for, like, three years. Mm-hmm. It took forever for me to get on board. And, hey, the half-court king, <laughs> nice. the half-court shot king, and a guy that comes in and plays, he's not the best defender, but he gives – High level effort on defense, and he hits shots when Boston needs it. So, yeah, my first honorable is uh, Peyton Pritchard. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, a little against. Yeah, just just because of how much I used to down him and dog him, I, I had to give him some kind of type of shout out. That's... Now that he's a champion, especially. Yeah, I appreciate that though. All right, my uh, my first honorable mention is gonna be all the old heads. And I'm going to pair them up together. I'll put my two old heads after you finish yours. I'm going to do all four of them okay. just together just to make it easy. None of these guys I was able to watch in college, obviously, um, or even watch in the NBA. How, I was, how, how old are I mean, we talking? There was one. Because I'm talking 2000s as an old. Yeah, there was only one that I got to watch in the NBA, and even then I was too young to really know what I was watching. Um, but the first pairing is Magic and Bird. Uh, the, eh. yeah. What do you have to say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They kind of built what the NBA has become in in right. modern day basketball. Yep. And then uh, my other pairing was Michael Jordan and James Worthy. They're just winners on all yeah. levels, like Hall of Famers. Great college players won a championship together in college and won yeah. championships in the league. And Michael Jordan being the only one that I watched in the NBA. And I was probably too young to remember. But, yeah, I just figured I'd mention those guys real quick. That's my first honor roll. So you can go ahead with okay. your old. So, guy. yeah, I have a theme on my list with guys that played together in the NBA that also had like great college careers. Mm-hmm. It just came out that way somehow. And these two guys played in the league together, made a finals together, and were both college greats. Mm-hmm. And that would be Jameer Nelson and JJ Redick. <laughs> okay, I like Jam- those. Yeah, Jameer played with Delonte West at St. Joe's, J- St. Joseph's. Yeah, in two thousand two, three, and four. And for some reason, they came out of nowhere and just dominated college basketball for like three years. Yeah. 
Now, they never made like a really deep, deep run in the tournament like some people expected, but Jameer was an All-American level point guard at a mid-major school, had them in the top 10 for like two years, and went on to Orlando and was a like borderline all-star. If you, I think he made one all-star team mm-hmm. and was like the pre-Mike Conley where he was like an underrated guy that like kept the team moving. But people like rarely brought him up when he played in Orlando. It was all about Dwight Howard and Rashard Lewis and those guys. Right. So Jameer Nelson had a good transition and he was an undersized guard, which made it even harder. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Jameer and then JJ Redick, four years at Duke, one of the greatest college players ever, one of the greatest shooters ever Mm -hmm. in college and the NBA. Uh, He had to sit for a few years in the league before he got his chance. Mm -hmm. But when he got in, he became a consistent rotation guy for the Magic. He was their best shooter, another guy that helped him get to the finals in 2009. Carried that over to the Clippers, where he became even better as a player, onto the Sixers. Sixers. He had a good almost like decade stretch in the league where he was like counted on to be a high-level shooter and contributor yeah. on playoff teams. Right. So, shouts out to Jameer Nelson and J.J. Redick. I like that. Yeah. And then, I, I do you have any more? I have a couple more, and I yeah, can I go too. through them really quick. Okay. Um, how many more do you have? Two. Okay. I'll do three. I'll do really quick. Um, I have three, but I'm not even going to mention the third just because okay. it's uh, like bias. <laughs> yeah. I was going to mention one that I don't really need to mention. So while you were talking though, I thought of a fun one that I totally forgot about and it all stems back from Peyton Pritchard. Um, favorite, one of my favorite players and also just a full-time role player for out, throughout most of his NBA career, Aaron Brooks. That's a that's a nice pull. Aaron Brooks was an Oregon legend. Yes. And, they and lost. a contributor on Rockets playoff teams. Yes. And they lost in the NCAA tournament to Florida, who went on to win the championship. And they, didn't, they lost by only like seven points. I just looked it up because I was trying to remember what the score was. And that Florida team was a powerhouse. So... Yeah, That's Aaron Brooks. Shout, was a shout out of mine. to him and Luke Jackson, who did not <laughs> translate to the NBA, but he no. was great at Oregon. No. Um, so then I'll add my other one, Shane Battier, an elite I, college player, and and became a high level three and D guy. Yes. Um, not my favorite player, but I appreciated his game. Um, his face guarding is some of the best I've ever seen. Listen, he's he's one of the few players that Kobe gave credit. Yeah. For guard like him, Raja Bell. It's a short list of guys that Kobe gave credit yeah. for defending. Right. And he was one of those guys that when I saw him first do a face guard where somebody was shooting, and it might have been a, a Kobe type thing, but people with hand in the face. Yeah. And Kobe <laughs> shoots and he puts his hand right yeah. in between without touching. I used to try to do that all the time when I was younger. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Again, he's not like my favorite player, mostly because he was on like the heat and stuff. He yeah. wasn't on my favorite as a kid he wasn't like an aesthetically pleasing player yeah i liked him when he was on the grizzlies but him and mike miller shooting threes was entertaining yeah but he he later became one of those guys that went to like championship teams or teams that were trying to get championships so that was off-putting to me but yeah super great so yep that's my uh, other honorable i flip-flopped on my last two (laughs) uh i'm gonna go with my bias pick because he's the youngest guy that either of us will list Mm mm-hmm and, hey, he played at Michigan. I love what he did, Franz Wagner. He didn't have a great, great career, but he had a very good two-year career at Michigan. Yeah. Made it to the Final Four in his second year. Won the Big Ten Championship. It was Juwan Howard's best year because of Franz Wagner mostly. Mm-hmm. And he's come to the league three years in. He's a 20-point scorer, like six assists, five rebounds. He's like oh, almost 25-5 and five guy. Yeah. And him and Paolo have got – the magic to the playoffs mm-hmm. for the first time in like almost a decade. He's so, got a lot of room to grow. Exactly. A lot of room to grow. And my other guy, Kawhi Leonard. Okay. Yeah. Two years at San Diego state. He became an all conference guy. I, I think he was all conference both years. Mm-hmm. He was mountain West player of the year. Second year. Him and Jimmer for debt were dueling it out in the mountain West. <laughs> Those were the days where kind of like still a golden era of college basketball where, yeah, you would tune into a Mountain West game on a Saturday afternoon and it would be great basketball. Yeah. But t- freshman year, 20% from three. Second year, 29% from three. He improved as a scorer. And we know what happened when he got to the league. Mm-hmm. 
went to the Spurs, got better and better, finals MVP, won a ring with the Spurs, got even better, won a ring as the best player in Toronto, and injuries have kind of messed up what he's been lately, but yeah. healthy, he's one of the top five players in the league, mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard, on both ends. How far would Jimmer for Fredette be up on your list if he had a decent NBA career? <laughs> he would be so high. <laughs> I loved watching Jimmer yeah. so much. He was like the follow-up of Steph after Steph left Davidson. Yeah. I, he's just a what could have been. Listen, putting BYU on the map, like it was insane watching him play. Yeah. He would step like three three dribbles over half court, and it was lights out. I'm glad he's had a successful career overseas. but Chinese legend. Yeah. CBA legend. 100%. Um, all right. My last honorable mention, I felt like, you know, we just have to mention these guys. That's the Florida boys. And I wrote down Corey Brewer and Joe Kim Noah. Corey scored 50, okay? I totally forgot. <laughs> Corey scored 50 in about a game. Al Horford. Um, none of these guys were my favorite player. Um, I kind of like Al Horford the most, and then probably Corey Brewer, and then Joe Kim Noah. And Corey Brewer had the worst NBA career out of the three. Um, but when you win back to back college championships, and then like Joe Kim Noah won a defensive player of the year, um, was on some really good Chicago teams. Um, and then, like you said, Corey Brewer, one of the weirdest 50 points. but And he was decent... part of that Rockets team that came back and beat the Clippers. Yeah, like he, Him and Josh Smith caught a heater. <laughs> he, he had some decent years off the bench yeah. and stuff. And then Al Horford has been pretty incredible most of his career. Is this, is this year 16, 17? Something like that. Yeah. And he, can, he was a serious contributor to a championship team. He was on the old Atlanta team that was supposed to win a bunch of things and never did. Yeah. Um, and he finally got himself a championship with the Celtics, so... Congrats to him. He's he's probably going to make the Hall of Fame. Probably. Yeah. Because it's the basketball. basketball. Yeah. Yeah. I don't Good doubt for it. Good man. Good for Al. So, yeah, that was my last little honorable mention. So, into the top five. Here we go. You want me to start? Uh, I'll start, so then you can give okay. your number one right. last. Um, so, my number five, he's at number five because, obviously, he's one of my favorite players of all time, if not my favorite player of all time. And I didn't get to watch much of his college career. Again, probably watched the tail end, but didn't really fully know. That's Vince Carter. Nice. Uh, Nice. Another UNC standout. Just incredible player. And then we all know what he did in his NBA career. Um, The human highlight reel. And just incredible. Like, I can't put into words what he did for me watching the game. Um I wish my game would translate to how he played, but it did not at all. Um, I could never really get above the rim like he could, and I always wanted to. Most people never, ever no, have been able to. But um, just the way that he like brought power and finesse into the game um, was something so intriguing to me because like his in-game dunks were super powerful, but also he had this, like again, it's part of the, you know, floating in the air, but yeah. what he was able to do in the air besides just dunking was pretty incredible. And then as he aged, he developed more of a three point shot and he aged pretty gracefully into the, into his later years. Obviously, you know, when he was ending his career with the Hawks and stuff, it's not as, not as great. Yeah, but, but by the time he hit Dallas, that's when people started noticing how well he had aged. Right. Yeah. He had his, <laughs> It's a year with the magic that I always forget Listen, about. When he hit Phoenix, I kind of thought it was over. Yeah. That was like 2011, 2012-ish. Mm-hmm. But, the, yeah, he went to Dallas and then did really well. Yeah. So he was able to kind of revitalize his career. But I had to put him on the list at number five, um, mostly because, again, didn't get to see as much of his college career. But, yeah. Nice. So my five guys are, like, all different reasons for why I have them on the list. Mm-hmm. So my fifth choice is one half of the greatest shooting backcourt in NBA history, Clay Thompson. Okay. Two years at Washington State, mm-hmm. average 18 a game. He was two-time all Pac-12, uh, Pac-12 all freshman, uh, 2011 all Pac-12 tournament team. One of the best shooters in the country. Mm-hmm. Actually, he played three seasons, not two, excuse me. 2010, he averaged 21 a game. Uh, shot 46 percent. No, that's that's from two. His three point percentage. I don't know why this is. Well, it's not moving. I don't. 39 percent from three his last season. Mm-hmm. But 
a big reason why I put him on this list is because in those three seasons, he put Washington State basketball on the map. Yeah. When it never really existed. Mm hmm. Like they had had a few pros every now and then in the past, but they didn't. They never had a noteworthy basketball program. Yeah. And in his three years, he they became a conference contender and made the tournament. And he became a lottery pick because he became like a high level standout mm-hmm. college player at a school where nothing usually ever happened. Yeah. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. A lot of credit for that. And he parlayed it into be getting picked by the Golden State Warriors. Nobody knew at the time he was getting paired with probably like the most perfect matchup in NBA history. Mm-hmm. And listen, the one A one B Stephen Clay, whoever you want to choose, Clay has had some of the greatest shooting performances in league history. Yeah, and that's why I have him at my five. Okay. He he made a huge mark in college at his school. Was a really high level player, and then. Took it to a whole nother level in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah, Clay at my five. I like that one. It's a good surprise to me. Kind of forget about. I have a few surprises. Okay. Yeah. Um, My number four is similar to my number five. Um, It's a homer pick. Um, Again, didn't really get to see his college career, but we just saw UConn win back-to-back championships, and the first championship they ever got, Came from Richard Hamilton. Um, wow. What? I'm kind of surprised. Surprised? Rip Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. So I like it. I, again, it, it was tough to put him in the top five just because I didn't really get to see his college career. I, again, I kind of remember like him getting drafted and stuff um, and seeing like his college highlights and things. I don't think I watched college basketball at that time because um, that was 99 that they won. Was it 99, 2000? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if I would have seen it, but again, um, when the trade happened um, and he went to like, when he went to Washington and things and played with Michael Jordan and all that, there was a lot of buzz around him. So I got to see a lot of his highlights and things like that. And he like willed that UConn team to a championship. They had two other NBA players that didn't do anything in the NBA on that roster. Um, but Rip Hamilton averaged 21 and a half, I think both in his sophomore and junior seasons. And then the junior season being when he won the, the championship. Um, and then he hit the, the game winner, if I'm not correct, or if I'm not wrong, right? He he hit a game winner in the tournament. Yeah, yes. it wasn't like a buzzer beater, I don't believe. It was. Was it a buzzer beater? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to remember all, everything. Um because I didn't pull it up before. But then we know he had a really good season um, or a really good NBA career with the Pistons mostly. Um, He did okay when he left the Pistons, kind of turned into more of just a three-point shooter, corner, spot-up guy. Um, But what he did for the the Pistons in general, leading the team in points for multiple years, um, playing here as long as he did, was just awesome. So I felt like I had to include him on the list. That's a really nice pull. Yeah. I think Tayshawn deserves some credit, too. He was... He was a he borderline was a All-American player at Kentucky. And yeah. He was a huge and, help for the Pistons. And that was another one that I liked, too, because he kind of fell in the draft to the Pistons. And I feel like that was a, a really good pick for the Pistons to be able to get him where they did. So, so I just made a swap on my list. That's what I just... Live time. That's what I did just before that. Because... because Rip was going to be my third, but I decided I'm going to put this guy up. Ahead. Yeah, so because you mentioned a UConn player, okay, that just instantly, like, light bulb in my brain. I took out my number four, and I just put on Kimball Walker. Mm. He is, like, he has some of the greatest highlight clips mm-hmm. of a college guard, like in college basketball history. Yeah. Like, the crossover – and the buzzer beater to beat Pittsburgh and win the Big East championship. Mm-hmm. The run he went on to win UConn a championship in 2011. He played three years at UConn, averaged 16, four and four overall. Mm-hmm. His last year is obviously the legendary one. Yeah. He averaged 23.5 a game. And he just went on an absolute tear. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was NCAA all tournament, NCAA champion. 
He was all Big East that year. I'm pretty sure he fi- finished like probably top five in Player of the Year. Mm-hmm. But yeah, what what he did, not just those uh, that season, but those three years, he got better every season. He went from um, nine points a game to 15 points a game to almost 24 a game. Yeah, like talking about like ultimate year to year improvement. As a like six foot five eleven guard, mm-hmm. and yeah, he was one of those guys in the early twenty tens that just became a legend, yeah, for dominant, absolute dominance when it mattered the most. Mm-hmm. In the con- when the Big East was still the Big East, he dominated that tournament in the Garden, and then he just destroyed the NCAA tournament, yeah, and put his stuff on the map for the NBA, and was Michael Jordan's maybe like one or two good picks. <laughs> As an owner, yeah, yeah. Kimball Walker was a Charlotte Bobcat, mm-hmm. got them to the playoffs. I think in his third year, they became the Charlotte Hornets. Made the playoffs, I think, two or three more times. And he was like one of the better point guards in the league in his prime before the injuries hit and like that aged him more. But yeah, like his mid to late twenties, he he was one of the better point guards in the league. Mm-hmm. Crazy handles, high level jumper, an offensive game. And just he he kept Charlotte afloat and kept them entertaining. So Kimba deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. Man, see now you start making me think of all these guys. Not that he would be on my list, but then I started thinking about Isaiah Thomas for Washington, what he did, and yeah. then what he did coming I into thought the about NBA. Him. I thought about him. <laughs> I, I just kind of started thinking about that. He again, he wouldn't make my list, but like you start thinking of names, it would be a lot of fun. All right. My number three is kind of the opposite of the last two guys. I remember vividly watching him in college. Didn't have as great of an NBA career, but he won a championship. Did he win multiple? I think he just won one. Um, And he had a solid NBA career, but it was nowhere near what he did in college. Um, And that, for me, being a big Kansas Jayhawks fan growing up, Mario Chalmers. (laughs) That's a I love that one. That is that is such a personal pick. I love it. It is. Um what he did in that tournament in 2007, 2008 will forever like be ingrained in my mind. <laughs> like hitting that game winner. Listen, big Cole Aldrich and Darrell Arthur guy, Joey Tysick. I was a big Cole Aldrich guy. <laughs> I know I knew it. I knew you were. <laughs> um <laughs> But, all right, let's pull up his stats real quick. I had it. Like, he only averaged 13 points a game, four assists. Big one was steals. He was a good defender in college. He had two and a half steals a game, um, a couple of rebounds. Shot the three at a crazy good percentage. Didn't shoot a ton back then. But um, the biggest part was just that game winner to me. And, like, the way that he played in the tournament, he played lights out, which was a lot of fun. And then you get into the NBA career, and... Where did he start? He didn't start with the Heat, did he? Or did he get drafted right to the Heat? He got drafted right to the Heat. Okay. Yeah. So he gets on the Heat team, and, you know, he he has kind of a lot to live up to, not because of his pedigree, but because of the team that he's on. Yeah. He's playing with LeBron James, Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, and he's their point guard. <laughs> and, like, again, I think for what he did – for that team is pretty important. Um, And again, I didn't like him as much in the NBA because I wasn't a big Heat fan, but because I liked him in college so much, that's the big deal to me. And pulling up his NBA stats, like he never averaged more than 10 points a game. (laughs) But yeah, he did his job. He had good amount of assists. He hit, he still was one of those guys that could hit big shots in the moment. And I think that was kind of a key part of his game. And he shot right around 40% from the three uh, for most of his career. So to me, I think that was good enough. Again, he was kind of close to not even making the list. But again, I just, I liked his college game so much. And he wasn't like, he wasn't crazy anywhere, but it just seemed like he did the right things at the right moments to make it enough. So, he made my my list. I like it. 
So my last three picks are all given mid major love. Okay. None of them are like high high level, high caliber programs. I got one high caliber. But they, they made them somewhat high caliber at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number three, I'm going with Damian Lillard. That's a good pick. Two time Big Sky Player of the Year, three time All Big Sky, two time All Big Sky Tourney, and 08 09 Big Sky Rookie of the Year. Overall, he averaged 19 a game in college. His second, third, and fourth year 20 a game, 18 a game, 25 a game. Like, you want to talk about college dominance? Yeah. <clears throat> Also, I, th- I want to mention him because there are a lot of guys that dominate mid-major or low mid-major college basketball. Mm-hmm. He went to Weber State. Yeah. Not the most noteworthy school. <laughs> they you don't play in the most noteworthy conference. Say. Exactly. Guys that come out of there, those types of schools, <laughs> Rodney Stuckey, um, those types of guys rarely ever transition well to the league. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you average 23, 24, 25. Some guys average almost 30 on the mid major, low mid major level. Right. And they get to the league, and there's no equivalent mm-hmm. at all. Dame came in as a rookie in Portland, and it was from the jump. I think, like, his first game of his career, he had like 20 something, five and five. Mm-hmm. Like, his game matched from the jump. He was a high level shooter coming in. He was only like 6'3", 190s coming in, mm-hmm. but was a high-level athlete. He was dunking on people. He had confidence. They gave Dame the keys yeah. coming out of Weaver State as a four-year guard immediately. Mm-hmm. And him and LaMarcus Aldridge had immediate, immediate chemistry. He became Portland's son from the jump. Yeah. So just off the fact that he came out of a four-year school, low-level uh, mid-major in Weaver State. Mm-hmm and did something that most guards have never done, which is come in and immediately just take hold of his position with yeah. confidence. I, I got to give it to Dame Lillard as my third. And he used to be one of my favorite players mm-hmm. in the league. For a while, he was like my second or third favorite player. Yeah. He had that stretch in Portland. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he straight from dominating in college to, I think he won rookie of the year, and then went straight to averaging over 20 from that. And has yeah. hit high levels as an individual player. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, good respect to Damian Lillard yeah. for what he's done. Yeah, that's a good one. The other one that comes to mind when you talk about that kind of guy is C.J. McCollum. He was my replacement at four. Was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> C.J. was my four. Yeah, what he I, did I, at I Lehigh. He, there. Just, he beat Duke. Yeah, it, crazy. <laughs> yeah. Crazy to think about. Okay, so my my last two, not really any surprises, um, but they're still fun. Um, and my number two is a guy that I really loved coming out of college. And as his career went on, I liked him less and less. <laughs> and you'll immediately okay. understand why it's just my criteria. My number two, Marquette legend, NBA legend, Dwayne Wade. Yeah. Oh man. That's, it's a tough one. Because I loved what he did in college. I vividly remember him in college. Had a really good career in college. He averaged 20 points a game, close to. Um, The end of his college career was getting blown out by another one that I thought about on my list, Kirk Heinrich's Kansas team. Captain Kirk. Uh, They lost by like 30 to that Kansas team. Listen, nobody expected that Marquette (laughs) team to make the Final Four. D-Way dragged them, even though they had good players. They had good players, but D Wade was a was Superman, right? And then he, in that NCAA tournament, he got him to a Final Four, yeah, which was incredible. Um, it's just funny to think about that that Kansas team was basically Kirk Heinrich and Nick Collison, and blowing out Dwayne Wade by thirty. Yeah. Just sounds weird. Anyway, was Drew Gooden on that team too? Or I think he was. He got drafted already. Yeah, I think yeah. he was already out. Um, so incredible college career, three years at Marquette, and then he gets to the NBA, and we all know Pistons could have drafted him, blah, 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 blah. And I liked his game a lot. I was a fan of Dwayne Wade. For some reason, I don't know why I did this, but when I was younger and I would play outside, you know, everybody does Kobe, Kobe. Yeah. For some reason, I did Dwayne Wade. And I would say it really, <laughs> wow. I would say it really fast and like joking around because I was young and juvenile, but I would say, Wayne Wade, Wayne Wade. <laughs> 
and I would do like <laughs> fl- like yeah. fancy stuff, um, messing around, which was a lot of fun. And then he knocked off the Pistons in 2006. Sadness. And it just didn't sit right <laughs> with me. And that didn't affect how much I liked Dwayne no, when it, I was younger. But it didn't. didn't. So that didn't affect it. I was like, cool. Young guy, early in his NBA career, getting a championship with Shaq. Kind of fun. Young new team. And then. And then? LeBron James joins <laughs> with Chris Bosh. <laughs> And ruins everything, and no longer. See, that's that's not that's not Dwayne's fault at all. He, like, are you sure? Should he have stayed on the? He should have left the Heat. <laughs> no, but <laughs> he like, should have told them no. He would have. I mean, he was in the conversation about the whole thing, so like, he was also. I'm not telling him no. But you're not telling him no. <laughs> it just, it just hurt inside. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, the ending of his career was a little rough too. It was bouncing around yeah. to Chicago. I thought Chicago was a nice thing. Yeah, it was it made awkward, sense. right? Even though they, it, it was awkward. I get it. And he then, wanted to do it for let's Chicago. Let's forget about the Cleveland thing. Let's that entire <laughs> roster. The memory of that roster is so depressing. Let's yeah. let's forget Cleveland. Yeah. Um, but multiple time champion, Hall of Famer, incredible career. Um. And it seems like he's still like he's still being an analyst. Sometimes he's stepping in here and there on broadcast. So what he's doing for the game outside of the game seems to be good. Um, and again, it was as you can see, I liked him so much in college, and then it just slowly teetered off <laughs> just because of different things outside of his control fully. But Dwayne Wade just had to big be my number two. Uh, my number two. It's an interesting one. They, your, but, all of yours have been interesting. Yes, I told you. I like it, though. I liked what he did for his college program and how he put him on the map and what he became in the NBA so much mm. that I had. I, I put him at number two as, like, this is a real personal favorite. Gordon Hayward. That's a, that's a good pick. Yeah. I'm disappointed I didn't <laughs> think of that pick, to be honest. Gordon Hayward. He might have knocked. No. He might have knocked Rip Hamilton out, and I would have just – because Vince Carter was a for fun, needed to be number five. Gordon Hayward might be my number. Yeah, uh, like you look at his numbers, like fourteen and a half, seven and a half rebounds, and two and a half ass- and two assists. Mm-hmm. Those are really pretty good college numbers. It's like a, but, it's kind of like similar to the Mario Chalmers thing for me, to where like college numbers weren't like crazy. They were, for, they were really really good college numbers. Yes, but what he did in that tournament. Yes, listen, NCAA All Tourney. Yeah, go ahead. NCAA All Region. 2009 Horizon Player of the Year, two-time All-Horizon, mm-hmm. 2020, 2010 All-Horizon all Tournament, Horizon All-Freshman, and 2008 Horizon Rookie of the Year. Yeah. Two years. First year average 13, second year average 15 and a half. Mm-hmm. But like you said, before him, Butler, they were a, a decent program. They had a few runs to the tournament where – they pulled a few upsets. Mm-hmm. Nobody really cared about Butler. Right. Two oh oh nine ten season. Shouts out to Shelvin Mack too. I was <laughs> a big up Shelvin Mack guy and did nothing in the NBA. Yeah. I'm Shouts out to Shelvin Mack. Mm-hmm. But Shelvin Mack, Gordon Hayward, and I can't remember the big man they had, but he was a really good college big man too. They went on a run in the twenty ten season. Mm-hmm. They win the Horizon, and let's not forget. Uh, Head coach, um, Brad Stevens. <laughs> yes, who got on the map with this season too, and has now made a name for himself in the NBA. But, yeah, they like they sweep the, they breeze through the horizon, get to the tournament, and they just start knocking people off. Mm-hmm. And they end up in the championship game against Duke. They take Duke to the to the wire in the NCAA tournament championship in 2010. Yeah. And Gordon Hayward almost hit a half court shot to beat Duke to win the in thing. the NCAA championship. Yeah, that would have put him like at the, like top ten NCAA legends of all time. Mm-hmm. But that run solidified like Butler as a program. Matt Howard, Matt Howard, good pull. But that run solidifies Butler. They make the they make the te- uh, championship again. I think the next year they made back to back championships. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But yeah, Gordon Hayward puts him on the map. 
He's like a real scrawny, tall, athletic kid with some skill out of Indiana. Yeah, he they was, lost to Connecticut. Yeah, he was a tennis all American in high school, which is kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. He could have like played went even to even bigger schools to play tennis, but. Oh, yeah, he lost to the Kemba Walker team. Coming out of Butler, I had no faith in Gordon Hayward as a pro. Yeah. This was kind of at the time where, like, those types of players, like the Chase Buddingers, I'm not going to put the label on it, but the Chase, the Chase Buddingers, the Gordon Haywards, mm-hmm. I was like, I, I just, nah. Yeah, you're athletic in college. Yeah, you can score in college. I don't see it. Yeah. He slowly built his Utah backup and built himself into a serious all-star player. Yeah. The athleticism translated. The game wasn't that high level when he came in, but he got better every season. Yeah. And at his peak, like, he was dunking on people every week. Mm -hmm. He was hitting buzzer beaters. Like, Gordon Hayward was a serious, like, you cannot sleep on this guy player. Yeah. And he got Utah back in the playoffs. They were a competitive team. Mm Mm-hmm. What he built himself into, going from like a high level college guy, coming out of Butler, building that program up, to making himself an all star within like four or five years in the league, I didn't see it coming at all. Mm-hmm. I didn't think he could become what he became. Yeah, and he did it. And if it wasn't for the gruesome injury in Boston, yeah, I believe they might have won a championship in Boston. After that injury, he still made himself. A really good contributor for the team, but he's never really been the same Yeah, since he broke his leg that season. And it stinks because he's flashed, like, a comeback before. Yeah. And then something happens, and it derails it, and he's just never been the same since. Yeah, and then he just had a weird, awkward season in, where he got traded to OKC. Yeah. And they didn't really need him. It, it Yeah, it's it's been str- strange for Gordon Hayward mm-hmm. since he broke his leg. But, yeah, pre-injury, man. I I loved his game. He played like like a like an early two thousand small forward almost, mm-hmm. where you had to respect every level of his game. Like if you pump faked, he was gonna take you to the rim and get an and water dunk on you. Yeah. If you gave him space, he could hit the three. He could take you to the post and like give you fadeaway jumpers. Like Gordon had almost everything in his tool yeah. box. Yep. And I I loved him as a player. I was a big fan of Gordon Hayward. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, he's my number two. That's a good pick. I I am a little sad that I didn't think of yeah. Gordon Hayward. All right, number one is super easy. Running out of time. Well, he's one I wonder of, if we both have number him as, as number one. The greatest shooter of all time? <laughs> Let's get to it. You have to. You have it to. It was obvious. Good. It was obvious. He put Davidson on the map. Yeah. If you don't know, we're talking about Stephen Curry. Stephen what? Wardell Curry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What he did... For Davidson basketball. It was before Kimba. It was before Shabazz Napier. Mm -hmm. Like, we, I can't name another point guard that had that type of run with that type of program before Stephen Curry. I can't name it. Yeah. Like, you got the, like, Jared Jack at Georgia Tech, cool. But Georgia Tech was a good program at the time. Yeah. You had point guards at high-level programs making good runs. Right. He completely took it over. Mm -hmm. He took over the basketball world in that NCAA tournament run. Yes. And I just want to pull up who he beat again because. Uh, He he beat Georgetown. He beat, um, who else was it? It was a few teams before. He beat Wisconsin. I I believe he beat Wisconsin because they lost to Kansas. Yeah. To get to the final four, I think. Yeah, they got to the Elite Eight because. It stunk because the next year after they got bounced early, or early yeah. for them. Was it Gonzor? Was it Gonzaga, Georgetown, Wisconsin? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Good memory. <laughs> I, Number, I, I so, watched the highlights of that run yeah. too many times in my but, life. So just so everybody knows, they were the ten seed in the Midwest. Yeah. They faced off against the seven seed, but number twenty four Gonzaga. Then they went to the number two seed in there, Georgetown, which was Georgetown, who was number eight overall. That was the Roy Hibbert, like Daniel Ewing, yeah, that team. I believe Dewan Summers, Pistons legend, was Probably. on that team too. 
Then they took down number six overall, Wisconsin. Yeah. That was in the pal. I believe they was that in the palace. It might have been. Or I, I think that was in Detroit. But Steph in the yeah. first round had 40. That was in Detroit, I believe, because I, I think that was the yes, year. Yes, Ford Field. Yes. Is that Ford Field? North, yeah. I just went over and it mm-hmm. shows. Um, 30 in the second round, 33 in the Sweet 16. He had 25 in the Elite Eight, and he lost by two Yeah, to Kansas. Again, the next year kind of fell short. They uh, – Beat South Carolina and lost to St. Mary's in that game. Who was on that St. Mary's team? That's a good question. I don't think um, – who's the Australian point guard? I don't <laughs> Matt, think he was there yet. It shows Dele he was. Oh, okay. Daly was probably like a sophomore on that team then. A freshman or a sophomore. He was a freshman. Okay. So I guess Delhi was on that team. Delhi Was Robert Sacre on that team? <laughs> Patty Mills might have still been on that team. Oh, oh, my God. I forget Patty Mills went to St. Mary's. So – yeah, as far as I can see, yeah, that looks like actually Robert correct. Sacre went to Gonzaga, I think. But yeah, that might have been the Patty Mills team. Yeah. Anyway, I'm looking it up, but and then what can't we say about Steph Curry's NBA career? Yeah, rough start, injuries. But, Everybody knew he could shoot, but, but he was second in rookie nobody, of the year voting. He lost to Tyreek yes. Evans, but but he also almost got traded. Yeah, which is the crazy part. Mm-hmm. They thought about keeping Monte Ellis and trading Steph. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you could you imagine <laughs> how different how, things would be? This history, I don't I don't know where we would be right now mm-hmm. if Stephen Curry wasn't a, a Golden State Warrior. Yeah, but they chose Steph, mm-hmm. and history. Ten time yeah. All Star. He's almost a ten a top ten player of all time. Career leader in threes. Four rings. Yeah, like you said, he could be top 10 all time by the time it's all said and done. He's already right around that area. Some people have him out. Some people have him in. But, yeah. And it's crazy. He changed the game. People now talk about Caitlin Clark being the Steph Curry of the WNBA. That remains to be seen. But people aren't comparing players to like Kobe Bryant anymore. It's Steph Curry. Yeah. He's like the the guy that everybody tries to be nowadays, which is wild. He's completely taken over the league. Um immediately became one of my favorite players just because of his shooting ability and yeah. Listen. Again, everybody just remembers that college run and that's when we were introduced to Steph Curry. And then I think the biggest thing too for me was you're like, how is his game going to translate to the NBA? Nobody knew. Because he's still undersized. Minnesota didn't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Minnesota had no idea. Yeah. Let's go with Ricky Rubio and Johnny Flynn. And even though the Knicks have rebounded, poor Knicks, they were like, they were one pick away. Yeah. They were one away. Yeah. So, crazy career, both college and NBA. And, yeah. A- apparently consensus number one. Listen, I, I will say... His unanimous MVP season, I believe, was that the year they went 72-10? and 10? I think it was. Mm-hmm. And he won back-to-back MVP. That was the most enjoyable year of watching a team, besides like the Pistons when I was younger, I've had in my life in terms of NBA basketball. If only they would have won the championship. Like while watching that Warriors team like two or three times a night on ESPN and TNT, mm-hmm. it's like they – it was like the 96 Bulls. Yeah. Their offense never broke like rhythm. Mm-hmm. Every time they started a game, they were ahead by like 10 points. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it seemed like. Mm-hmm. And they would go up by 30 and it would just be over. Yeah. It 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 didn't make sense how good they were and how good Steph was. Yeah. That season. And my favorite thing, like I became an immediate Warriors fan just because of how they played. Now a lot of people got drawn away from when Kevin Durant came in, but I just like that they move the basketball. Yeah, Pre-KD, like Sean Livingston, Leandro Barbosa, when Iggy was still starting at the three, mm-hmm. David Lee, Andrew Bogut, that's the team we're talking about. Yes. Festus Azili, backup center. God. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the Warriors. Mm-hmm. Man, it, it warms my heart. I saw yeah. something the other day, too, and I don't want to get on a Warriors tangent because we got to end the show, but I forgot – Jordan Bell was a guy on that team. Yes. He came 
was it the KD year or was it year I before? I believe it was the KD Maybe, year. Maybe, okay. Yeah, he was decent, and now he's out of the NBA. He was their starter. <laughs> I, I forget about that sometimes. Wow. But anyway, Steph Curry, greatest college and NBA player yeah. of all time, in our opinion. And so, I hate Michigan State, but Draymond, hey, man. Yeah, he's Great up. college career. He's up. Hall of Famer. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we're not old enough to talk about guys like Bill Russell, Bill Walton. Um, easy picks. Yeah, Will. <laughs> You can go on and on about players back then. Yeah. Um, the other one that I thought about, too, that I, I looked up. Oh, but I Jerry West. Yeah. Jason Terry. Jason Terry. It's a good one. Arizona. But I was never a big yeah. fan. So, But it's something that I saw on a list. But all righty. This has been Views from the Sideline. Went over again, but eh, I don't care. It's fun. Um, I love doing these lists. Next week, it might just be straight up list. Maybe some news and notes. Um, I never know what's going to yeah. talk. Oh, we wait, got, we got to talk about the draft. We, we, I'm totally lost. Yes, we we have to do some sort of heat, mock draft. The Michigan summer heat has gotten to me. Yeah. We, we might present the most awkward. That's what the episode should be called, the most awkward mock draft in NBA history. Yeah. That's what the episode is going to be because we have no idea yeah. who is going where. It's all up to what we personally like. But it's going to make it fun, and I'm sure that somebody in this draft class is going to do something special, and we're going to be like, what? That guy? Yeah. So. It won't be Zachary Reza Shea. I'll tell you that right now. Could it be Zach Eady? Yao Ming 2.0? <laughs> Find out next week. <laughs> All right. This has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next week.